Howdy, everybody, and welcome to another podcast episode of Film Creative Voices. How's it going, guys? <laughs> We're your hosts. I'm Walter. This is Arlene. And we are having our part two Megapod. And in this episode, we're going to talk to、uh, Marty Go. She's the director and writer for a movie called Remittance. Melanie Ramos, director and writer of Limbo Land. And John John Agustavo, and he is the writer and director for、uh, a movie called Just a Kid from Seattle. And they were recently featured over at the LA Asian Film Fest.、Uh, LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. And、um, speaking of film festival, I, how did you like the festival? What'd you think? It was awesome. I got to go the past few days and、uh, we were down at LA Live and we got to see some of our other guests that、uh, came here and、uh, we got a chance to chat with them. And the craziest part about all of that,、yeah. we had a family moment, guys. My son, who is four and a half years old, Prince Vince, lost his first tooth. During the fever and the fret,、um, eating a hot dog. And he was sitting right in between me and Uncle Walter.、Mm-hmm. And he didn't even cry. So thank God. Yeah, I was, to be honest, guys, I was very impressed with,、uh, I was impressed with Vince <laughs> in keeping his composure. And he sat, he sat through two movies and he actually watched it. He, he watched Fever and the Fret and,、uh, and Neil Manila. And, Yeah, even with the violence in Neo Manila, he, he, was, he was well composed and he, he actually paid attention、uh, to the story and to the. Yeah, he had a lot of comments actually. So, throughout The Fever and the Fret, which is an awesome experimental film,、uh, it, it, it gets really deep into kind of like these、uh, different metaphors. And,、um, and it, it's, it's so interesting because I feel like as adults,、uh, People tend to overthink it because、mm-hmm. as we were so- sitting down talking with Kath、uh, Gulick, who is the writer, producer, and director for the film, she was saying,、uh, you know, a lot of people didn't get it. Either they really loved it or they just were confused by it. <laughs>、yeah. And my son is like, Mama, she just wants to go home. Mama, she's unhappy. Oh, she's happier there. <laughs> like, he totally understood the entire movie, which is brilliant. I loved it. He,、so、yeah, he's happy he just to got see it. it. Yeah, yeah, he totally got it. And with Neo Manila, with all the violence, we, okay, so I know I'm going to probably get a lot of comments about this, but I, you know, we do watch a lot of shows with our, our son.、Um, he's seen certain parts of Game of Thrones, Walking Dead, <laughs> and we kind of like talk about a lot of things with him. And、uh, even during like Neo Manila, of course, he could close his eyes during some adult portions、uh-huh. and whatnot, but. Um, when those adult portions were over,、mm. his comments were, Mama, they need more clothes. <laughs> I was like, Yes, it's probably really hot in the Philippines. And he's like, But they still need more clothes. They need pajamas. And I'm like, That's true. And then he asked me, What are they doing? I'm like, They're getting ready to go to sleep. That's what you tell them. <laughs> That's what you tell them. <laughs> it's like, I'm、okay. not even g o n n a He watched Game of Thrones, guys. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> he's like, Mama. <laughs> I know. Because, oh man. And、like, he's such a boob dude, too. And so he's like, Mama, boobies. I'm like, shh. As the director is sitting right in front of us, by the way. <laughs> oh, he did? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how loud he was whispering, but he finally mastered whispering because before he didn't understand that concept. So. Yeah. So、Sorry. before the movie started,、um, the director of.、Uh, Neo Manila, who is、uh, Mikhail Red, was sitting right in front of us. And、uh, one of、uh, Phil Am Creative's own、uh, or members,、um, Abe Pagtama, was there. Shout out to you, Abe. And、um, he was like kind of warning Arlene about, like, hey, there's some adult content on this. <laughs>、uh, you, I don't know. You know, he was kind of like, I guess, nervous about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I turned、so、over、good. to Vince and I was like, hey, Vince. There's going to be some violence and probably some graphic stuff. And if you have a problem with it, the director's right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any, any violent scene,、um, Vincent likes to tell me, no fighting. Mama does not like fighting, which is true. So, I mean, he, he's a good kid about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I have to be like, very conscious of it sometimes because like, he does、uh, say things and he'll repeat things and,、uh, or he'll ask a lot of questions of, well, why are they doing that? You know, and, and I don't know how to explain that. Why do they、that. do that before to go to sleep? They go to sleep, mom. 
<laughs> he's gonna be like, I'm going to sleep, mom. <laughs> he, he's totally that kid in the elevator, you know, when it beeps. Uh-huh. And he'll totally be like, eh, eh, eh. And so that's why I'm like worried that if he like watches something and he hears it, that, you know, he might start imitating. I mean, as long as he's not that kid who presses all the buttons in the elevator. No, but he does love to push buttons. That is a real thing. Yes. I mean, <laughs> oh, man, don't get me started on little kids. who. If your kids press buttons in the elevator, you, you need to check them because that's just wrong. <laughs> Especially when you live on the 15th floor of a building and it's your 25th birthday right. and you're really hungover and you really have to, like, yak somewhere and someone just goes, right. True story, guys. Can I... Can I also just, uh, I mean, kind of a change of set. Well, not really. But at the LA Asian, I just, I saw uh, Daniel Day Kim and mm-hmm. DJ Han from Linkin Park. Yeah. And, man, I almost stopped in my tracks. I was like, yeah, and yo, yeah, you were with me. Like, I, was I like, pointed them out. Yeah. I was like, holy crap. That's DJ Han and Daniel Day Kim. I mean, to me, that was kind of fanboying about that. And, um, it was great to see him. And Your fanboy was pretty silent then. Well, I imagined you to be like giddy. <laughs> nah, nah, I'm not a Japanese schoolgirl. <laughs> only at home behind closed yeah. doors. Only when, it's, <laughs> only when it's Ryan Reynolds. Oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I know your type. That's Deadpool. Oh. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, which, no, I, I have met Ryan Reynolds in person. Uh, I met him on the red carpet. Is he super handsome? He is. A, I, will, I am secure enough in my sexuality to say that he is handsome. a good-looking man. Yeah. And he's real cool, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and just having a conversation with him, he was just awesome. And he's just, you could tell the, the wit and sar- sarcasm. And, like, just being Deadpool is almost just a natural thing for him. So it was great. Uh, but, yeah, like... To, it, I'm such a fan of Linkin Park myself that to me, just seeing uh, DJ Han just casually walking was, down the street, ca- and then you right know, I, and then he threw a wave at me, and then I realized it was actually the guy behind us. Mm-hmm. It's one of those moments, guys. <laughs> That's how he dreamed of it, guys. I was like, I was like, hey, I was there. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't me. It was like this. Almost, you almost did this like double take of it was like a delayed reaction. I was like, oh look, look who it is, and you're like. Well, like yeah, because I was like, I, I didn't expect that. I, was, I thought you were just talking about like someone we knew from Phil I'm Creative. No, I was like, I thought it was one of no. our folks. And I was like, oh, I mean, kind of, you know, we'll try to claim them. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, LA Asian is just a sea of Asian people. So I'm like, I don't know. I was like, do I know? <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of people that, uh, that I saw online that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, some film creative members out there. Yeah. So it was cool. It was good to see the community out there uh, supporting everybody. It was cool because it was like a reunion, <laughs> like a mini reunion. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, run into like real. friends in, that you've never seen or haven't seen in a long time. And I mean, that's the kind of the nature of the uh, film industry. So, you know, you run into people and you see them and you haven't. And you're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then you don't see him for another three months. Right? <laughs> We're all connected some way or another. Some way, one way or another. Um, Whether you like it or not. And so speaking of connected, I'm looking forward to our first guest. You know, we're going to talk to Marty Go, And she, she made this awesome film that was featured on, at, was, that played at LA Asian uh, called... She, it was, it's called Remittance. And she is, that short film is the third place winner of the HBO Asian Pacific American Visionaries uh, short, mm-hmm. short film contest. And so it's pretty amazing. She is the only uh, Filipino American in the top three, nice. which is, is a huge deal. And on top of that, she made this film while on vacation on a cruise. Yep. Going rogue. She just went rogue, <laughs> and it, uh, and it's a fascinating story. We were talking to her in the green room earlier, uh, and I can't wait to bring her out uh, and let's all talk to her. So we're gonna take a moment, uh, speak, get a word from our sponsors, and give you guys some info about things coming up. So come back, check it, check us out. We will be with uh, Marty Go when we come back. Today's episode brought to you by the good folks at Filipino Worker Center. From the heart of historic Filipino town, 
PwC focuses on providing programs that help meet the immediate needs of workers and their families, while at the same time building their leadership to take collective action for long-lasting change. Howdy, everybody. We have Marty Go with us. She is the writer, director, producer of Remittance. And so, dude, how have you been? Good, uh, busy, and tired, but good. <laughs> yeah, so how, how was LA Asian uh, Pacific Film Festival for you? Oh my you? gosh, the event was amazing. Like, HBO really did it up. I was completely floored. There was special HBO APA visionary pillows everywhere. Wow. And free tequila, um, <laughs> a kick-ass DJ. It was, like, amazing. They had the whole red carpet and just, like, oh my God, it was Sorry, amazing. tell me more about this tequila. Um, so <laughs> I took a lot of it, so I actually forgot, but it was really, really fun. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about remittance for our viewers out there who yes. have not seen the trailer yet? Um, well, you should actually watch it cause it's on HBO right yeah! now and you can search it <laughs> under remittance and there it's on HBO go HBO now, uh, zone, uh, all the all the HBOs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you can watch it now. So um, it's about a Filipino cruise worker whose world falls apart when she can't contact her son, who's uh, sick in the Philippines. Nice. Yeah. So how did how did you go about making this film? Like, what what sparked you to let's just film while we're on a family cruise? <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw the post on um, Facebook actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, but years before that, my friend had won the competition years ago, and I, I saw that it really jump-started his career, and I was like, I need to find a way to make a short for HBO, and like, I had it on my vision board. I had I have HBO on the corner of the vision board, and I'm like, every day, I'm like, I'm going to have something on HBO. Anyway, so I saw a Facebook post of um, apply to HBO for your short films if you're Asian American. I'm like, oh my God, I have to do this. And uh, the two weeks before I was about to go on a cruise to Alaska for my sister's birthday, um, I saw the post and I was like, oh my God, I have to make a movie. It, it has to be about home. And I knew I was going on this cruise ship that had thousands of Filipinos on it. And I'd been going, yeah. <laughs> That's a true fact, guys. True story. Yeah. Especially Royal Caribbean. <laughs> Love that cruise line. Um, so I've been going back and forth from the Philippines because I'm writing another feature. And all my family back at home and all my cousins and aunts and they all do the same thing you know one person has to go to another country such as my cousin Roy who's moved to Dubai and he sends remittances you know money home to support um, yeah. my cousins and my mom did that she moved to the United States and my aunts pulled all the money they could together to put her through um, med school to send her to the to send her to America so that she could support the family back at home mm -hmm. so it that was like kind of at the top of my mind when I when I saw the post for home and knowing that my this cruise ship was going to be filled with Filipinos I was like I have to make a movie about Filipino cruise workers that's it and um I went with um my family and my boyfriend who's my filmmaking partner he's also a DP and had my family play roles in it you know my brothers like with the manager I'm starring in it and uh and we just, we made it within the, the seven days that we were there. How long did it take you to come up with a script? Okay, so this is interesting. We didn't write a script. We wrote bullet points. I knew that it needed to be obviously a female character, a woman who's missing her son. She needed to go through a journey of not being able to contact her son at home, something to up the stakes, such as him going to the hospital, um, and then increasing the story to a climax and then to a resolution. But we didn't have, you know, there's no, there's no lines in the film. There's, there's a lot of like, uh, voicemail messages and like a couple, like a couple lines, but, uh, again, it was just us and I mic'd myself and like, <laughs> there was a, there was a, a part where we climbed like this mountain to get into a glacier we crawled <laughs> underneath it and inside mm -hmm. it and we had the camera in our backpack and like my costume in my bag and we're like Ooh, climbing a mountain i mean it was crazy it was that's nice yeah. that's amazing <laughs> how much of the footage that you shot made it into the final cut um i would say i would say like 80 percent of it went wow. in wow yeah nice yeah. i mean so that's i awesome. mean basically it was like a lot of just improv acting exactly then. A lot of improv acting and then finding it in the edit. Yeah. Wow. Um, how about 
costumes and like you just you said your brother played the yeah the ship he he played the manager but i googled i was like what do they wear on this cruise and i like <laughs> i went to um salvation army and i found a shirt exactly like what they wear no way and uh my brother like the managers they kind of wear separate things like you know just like dress shirts with collars and and ties and so he, that's what he wore but i you thought know, you actually like got some of like somebody from the cruise line i thought you got one of their <laughs> manager outfits no that's no, what no, i no. was thinking like oh she, the way they did the costumes and all of that like they had to have gotten <laughs> well there involved. was there was fellow uh like uh the people that clean our staterooms and stuff yep. like that i asked them i was like do you guys want to be in a movie and they're like yeah of course i'm like okay you're just in the background <laughs> cleaning and they're like they yeah, can't say cool, no that's perfect and they're like you can borrow my vacuum you can borrow the cart i'm like this is this is unreal <laughs> wow i mean shout out to those uh, employees going above and beyond for their customers i'm <laughs> telling you royal caribbean is the way to go they're amazing yeah have they I approached you yeah have they been like, hey great job your sponsorship yeah, <laughs> have they approached exactly. you yet <laughs> uh, not yet but i mean like you know there's two ways to look at this and i think that the cruise ships and people being able to find work on these cruise ships is amazing because there there isn't a lot of job opportunities in the philippines mm -hmm. like my family grew up in very very poor areas that you know you have to go away to, to find money you know my dream is to to help build an economy in the philippines whether it be bringing my films there to shoot and providing work there but again i look at these cruise ships and i'm i'm thankful for those opportunities for you know because they provide opportunities for filipinos and where were you born and raised um i was born in pittsburgh pennsylvania oh what but i was <laughs> raised in florida i moved there when i was three is that oh, why nice. you're wearing yellow and black Steelers. just a good coincidence yeah exactly <laughs> um Going back to like, uh, yeah, because going back to the, the Philippines and economy, like, yeah, because I think I read somewhere that uh, Philippines had the most number of like money, wires yep. and remittances. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what the Filipino economy relies on. Most of the income comes from remittances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of talked about your inspiration and, and and it's because you've been to a lot of cruises and you realize that there is a... Or... That was my first cruise, but oh, I nice. have been to, you know, resorts around the world and I, you know, have plenty of cousins and family that, that work abroad and know that life of sacrificing your own happiness for the well-being of your family, you know? What's been the reaction to your film? Really good, really good, which is... Uh, it's like, it's really satisfying specifically to do a story like this that is very personal for my for my family and for my mom you know she always felt that she sacrificed a lot to be here and not be with her family and her sisters who are best friends back at home but couldn't move back there and just the pain that she has to go through to be apart from them is just watching her cry and but being able to support so many people back in the philippines has been like i don't know it's been really rewarding and to know that like I don't know. We're, I'm re I'm part of representing people that have not been seen in the film industry. You know, we we've seen the Japanese stories, we've seen Chinese, we've seen Korean, but I I've not seen any Filipino stories barely. And um, do you feel I like just, there's like a turning point right now where Filipino stories are becoming? Uh, more prevalent. I want to be that turning point. Yeah, <laughs> but I want to be part of it. You know, like that's that was my my biggest goal of like going to film school. I was like, I'm so sick of like being typecast to something that I'm not. And I, this these stories need to be seen. We exist too, you know. So I'm I'm so excited. And, and there is a lot of stories like you know that people asking for female filmmakers. What is your story? Who are you? Where are you from? They want original content. We're tired mm -hmm. of seeing the same old things, so it's amazing that we are new out there. A lot of people are like, "What are Filipinos?" You know. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, speaking of stories, you know, I kind of want to delve into yours. Um, I I read an article about you at in your old alma mater in Dreyfus mm -hmm. uh, School of the Arts. Yeah. Right? And your your interview it was really interesting. So can you tell us a little bit about? I'm personally curious about how you talked about how you were, uh, the way you were treated in your previous schools, and mm -hmm. then when you got into uh, Dreyfus. Dreyfus was amazing. Um, Dreyfus and where I got my BFA in acting at Florida State, 
There was a lot of uh, colorblind casting, which was amazing because I was allowed to play parts that I didn't look like, you know? I, I've i played male, female, uh, uh, different ethnicities. It was all dependent on your acting abilities. Mm -hmm. And so when I had that, to be able to push my limits of, you know, what I felt inside the the parts that were available to us at that time were just being able to stretch yourself um, with your artistry. And then it was like a big slap in the face to move to LA and it's like, you're a geisha and a nail technician and right. the Asian chick, you know, or it's like you're squashed down to like this body. This is what you are. And so when I experienced that, um, the dichotomy of like what I was uh, bred to do my whole life and then told that you're only a body, it was very frustrating. Yeah, and I mean, I I do know what you mean in a sense, that, like when I was in film school too, mm -hmm. um, I had acting class and then after my very first monologue, like everyone, you know, they liked it, my teacher liked it. And then but the next class, she was like, that's good. And then now do it with an accent. Oh or gosh, like that. really? <laughs> no, no, yeah. And yes. I, I understand what she was trying to get at, like, yeah. but she and I was like, and I did it, and I was like, she's like, how'd that feel? I'm like, not good, yeah. you know, that doesn't feel. And she's like, she's like, yes, but are you ready for that? Like, because that's gonna happen yep. to you in the industry. And I'm like, yep. And I mean, my classmates, we we're pretty, di pretty diverse too, and they're just like, they didn't like that thought, and. Right. And she's like, I'm just telling you what they're gonna put you in the box like that, and just be ready and just basically, she was just trying to prepare me to have my uh, thicken up my skin, and it's true. I mean, and it's, right. it's sad, you know. I went into audition and um, like they said, it's really vague. Like Asian, the Asian character have accent, but they didn't say what kind of Asian character, right? right. Oh. So yeah, so I went in there and like had this Australian accent, like yes. right before I even entered the oh, I audition. Yeah. I, and then they're like, oh, so where are you from? And I was like, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Homer Dulu at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, none of them were Australians, so they didn't know. Like, um, it was hilarious. And, and eventually, I before I wrapped up the audition, they were like, they, they were all happy. And I was like, yeah, I'm just let you guys know. I'm, from LA, <laughs> I'm from America. Yeah, I just, yeah. You said come in with an accent, so I came with an accent. They're like, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, of course I didn't get it, but you know, I was like, whatever. Dude. Oh my God, I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. How, how long did you act for before, um, uh, you know, going into uh, being a director and producer? Uh, my whole life, really. I was doing theater. I was in a kid's TV show for like five years. Oh, and yeah? then I uh, did professional theater and commercials and stuff like that, so. Ever since I could talk, really, yeah. And, and then, then, oh, go ahead, sorry. When did you become uh, a director? Um, that's after I went, uh, after I moved to LA and then started getting cast as those stereotypical roles, uh, getting really frustrated. And I kind of was like, I'm going to go USC. I'm going to apply to film school so that I can write, produce, and direct my own thing. I'm just, I can't wait for people to give me roles that I just hate, so. <laughs> yeah. And I do love that part, and you mentioned in that interview that, um, because I feel the same way, not just for film, but for acting, and you said acting, but like for, in film in general, like to, I wish, you wish you they taught you how to do the business side yes, of it. Yes, yes, so I important. so agree with you on that. Like it's I finished film school. more important than almost anything, even yeah. more than talent, which is crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, just even the, doing the minute stuff of like, yeah getting your tax deduction and your tax break as an actor or as a DP yep. or a filmmaker, like that's something like a lot of the guys who later, who got mentorship from someone in the industry yep. uh, received. But like, I was like film school, like no one really, they just taught you how to do a budget and mm -hmm. all that stuff, but they don't really teach you how to do the personal stuff. Mm -hmm. I've heard that pretty consistent um, amongst like, friends who when I did not go to film school but um you know even within acting classes like mm -hmm. uh and it's kind of neat now because I feel like there are a lot more acting classes that do talk about that business aspect yeah. uh, but of course it's it's kind of still shortened 
Uh, it's yeah. not like an in depth. Mm -hmm. So how did you right. go about learning how to be a businesswoman? Uh, well, at USC, that was my main goal was to learn the business side of things. So I started producing and um, I started producing people's thesis films and uh, some people who had graduated years before came back to do their thesis. I, I produced it. They left and then they started hiring me right out of school. I was uh, producing features and nice. commercials and it was amazing because I got to learn how to make a film from the ground up, how to make a, a commercial from the ground up, wh where you get the money, how you're bringing in crews, how you're putting together budgets, how everything works. And being able to do that, you know, there's not that many producers, so there's a lot of work for producers. Um, and I kind of got carried away doing it. And as I was doing it in the last few years, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna get swept away producing. I need to start writing. I have to go back to my goal, why I um, went to film school in the first place. So I started writing features and um, uh, TV pilots and this short, made this short and like just everything. I, I was like producing all day and I'd get home at the end of the night and just like, I have to write. I have to finish this feature <laughs> and I just I kept going and kept going and then it just now I'm I'm getting back to what I've I set out to do can you tell us a little bit more about the projects that you have coming up yeah um okay so right now I'm producing a film um that stars Terry Crews and Ludacris and we'll be shooting that uh, starting on the 21st uh, we'll finish that and then I work with a company that uh, we are doing like a whole slate of films. So after that, I'm one of six directors for a horror anthology called Phobias. Um, mm -hmm. It's also being produced by Radio Silence, the guys who did VHS um, and Defiant. Um, and then after that, I wrote another feature called Rise based on the uh, the Nigerian girls who were kidnapped mm. by the Boko Haram. Wow, yeah. And so it's a thriller uh, drama based on a princess who is um, kidnapped by the Boko Haram and has to escape her captors. And then after that, <laughs> I mean, there's so many. Uh, a Filipino feature uh, called Binarong um, about the Mananangal. Do you guys nice. know that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's that film has been done so many times in the Philippines, but it's never been brought to the United States, and I want yeah. that. So I'm having a Filipino-American who goes to the Philippines with her boyfriend, unknowingly pregnant, and then is um, haunted by the, the Mananangal. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm so nice. excited When about do you that. sleep? My I God. Don't, I don't sleep. <laughs> so did all this happen? This was already happening, in the, or it was in the works before you won the HBO? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. I, like... Me and my boyfriend Brody, uh, we have like these whiteboards and we have just been listing all our dreams. Like I want to do a horror anthology. I want to do uh, a horror film. I want to do a drama. I want to do a TV pilot. And so we've just been going month by month. Like, all right, I don't care how tired we are. You have to write the first act of this. You have to write the outline of this. You have to submit to HBO this film, just everything all at once. So. It's just like oh nice. So you guys are kind of just doing this as a team and yeah. doing it together. Oh, yeah. that's sweet. So yeah. when you have those moments, because all of that just sounds so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I seriously feel like <laughs> holy shit, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's so much. When you have those moments of feeling overwhelmed, how do you get through that? Or when you have writer's block, like how do you how do you overcome those types of obstacles? Honestly, I've been reading a lot of books on achieving your goals and uh, just materializing everything that you've dreamt of. These things I've been writing in my journal since I was like 12 years old. And mm. now I'm finally at the point where I'm not scared anymore. I'm more scared to die without achieving it than to actually go for it and get rejected or whatever. So now it's like I've been reading all these books on how to like achieve your dreams what is it that you have to do and it's a constant reminder of like putting these things and just focusing yourself and a lot of meditation because it is overwhelming it is so overwhelming sometimes and it's exhausting but the meditation definitely helps <laughs> what would you tell yourself uh if you could talk to the 12 year old marty yeah. what would you tell her i would say uh be patient. Well, no, because I was very, very, very impatient when I was a kid. I was. I wanted everything now, and I wanted it fast, but I, I wasn't ready. 
So I think it's I, maybe it was being patient and just learning more and just not being scared. I think I was really afraid of what people would think if my writing sucked or mm -hmm. if I was seen to be talentless. I think I would just shut the voices off. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, and uh, speaking about your your child, your being twelve years old self, like, what was it like growing up in Pittsburgh, uh, Florida? Or yeah, you born grew up in, in Florida, Pittsburgh, she's in raised, Florida. raised in Florida. Florida. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, how old were you when you moved out of Pittsburgh, or your family? I was only three, so okay, so I yeah, I was pretty much raised in Florida. So, what was that? Where where in Florida, and what was that like? West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, it is exactly what the newspapers say. <laughs> it's Florida. I mean, it's it's <laughs> like it's a vacation. Like you just go to the beach, you watch movies. There's not much to do. I was me, my brother, and my sister were like the only Asians in school. Mm -hmm. Um, it was very. I mean, there everyone was really super accepting of us, but because we went to that art school. You know, like the normal public schools, there was a lot of like fighting and just like it would have been terrible as a the only Asian in school. But at my art school, like there was no fights. If you fought, you were kicked out immediately. You guys just had dance offs. We had and, like, dance offs. Paint -offs. <laughs> How many exactly dance offs? Like How many dance offs did you have to in sync? <laughs> and uh, what's the one in uh, Pitch Perfect? Uh, exactly. Rip off or when the the singing one, right? Uh, what do they uh, call pitch it? Pitch Perfect. Yeah, yeah, but what did they call the oh, the competition? Oh, that oh the, the yeah, it's like the acapella. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Damn. Did you guys Fail. Do that? Yeah. Fail. I mean, honestly, there's more dance-offs between Filipino people. I mean, you guys know that. <laughs> True. You that. know that. You know that. But uh, yeah, I mean, going to those schools were amazing. Like everybody was so much like you're you're the cool one if you're talented and smart which is which is like so, so uncool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so cool not cool not cool at all yeah. Yeah. um oh so the that was bef that was dreyfus or that was before dreyfus also or because you went to middle what? so middle school high school is dreyfus mm -hmm. um they go from seventh to twelfth and then i went to florida state for undergrad and then USC for grad. Wow, seventh to twelfth grade. Yeah, that is one. Yeah, those are like a lot of uh, magnet schools, right? Mm -hmm. Magnet schools yep. are like that. Yeah, we auditioned oh, for wow. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I went to a magnet school, but it was like for ninth to twelfth. Oh no way! Where? Yeah. Then it wasn't true San Francisco. Magnet. I'm just kidding. Uh -huh. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't. Like, <laughs> it was a magnet for something else. I I learned how to survive the streets. Oh lord! <laughs> oh lord! I think Tough it's streets. Screech, screech. <laughs> nah, my bad. That's a, that's Florida slang. <laughs> um, and so, how did you like the move here? And you know, once once you moved to LA, what was that like for you? Um, it was well. I did one less than one year at, in New York because at, from Florida State we did like this whole showcase to get agents and stuff like that. And I had a, I had a bunch of agents there, um, but I was like, I hate it here. Like it's freezing and dirty and it's cold and it's very different than Florida. So mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had so many times the people in New York that were like, Why are you smiling? And I'm like. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I lived less than a year. Then I went to LA and I was like, this is this is where it's at. Like, this is warm. This is great. People are nicer. It's slower. But again, it was like, it was such a struggle trying to be an actor out here. And there's just so many people. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a lot so of many. talent here too. Oh yeah. Like, mm -hmm. And that's what I was saying. Like, you can be the most talented actor ever, but if you don't have the right connections or the business mind to, to be around that pocket of people you could be waiting forever it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how talented you are so uh luckily it's being able to be around the right pockets of people who can put you know the right people in place you know i think that's so true because like it, it's i feel like you have to be at like the right place at the right time surrounded yeah. by the right people who are right. going to encourage you because if you don't have that like mm -hmm. yeah and so many I don't know. So many mis Just don't get discovered. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I feel like the the successful people that I know, they really are around a lot of positive people. A lot of Absolutely. very encouraging people. Absolutely. From from the people because you've been in LA, you mm -hmm. know, for a decade. Mm -hmm. Are are you surprised or um did you feel like the people who have really made it it 
that that was very intentional uh, that you saw everybody saw that coming or were you more surprised um i think it well uh, to go back with a mindset and positivity i honestly it's as corny as it sounds it is everything it is everything because if you tell yourself you can't do it you're not going to do it mm -hmm. you're just not going to and and surrounding yourself with people who are who say to themselves i can do this it doesn't matter if a million people say no that a million and one person could say yes mm -hmm. i've found a really great group of friends who don't stop it's like uh, fine that financier said no to my project there's a hundred more people to go to that are that could possibly live like my project and speaking of finance like how mm -hmm. how have you been uh, how hard is it to finance certain projects over the other you know whether it's uh people of color as the main cast or yeah. not or subject matter like how's that adventure well, been specifically with my filipino movie um been wrong it was tough because when it first when i first wrote it I, it was going out to everyone and a lot of people were like oh filipino hmm what's that uh <laughs> what we have chinese financiers why don't you change it to chinese um like a chinese film i'm like I'm sorry, that's just, I don't know that world. I don't know that folklore. This folklore is specifically Filipino and that's what I want to do, you know? And I had so many different uh, distribution companies and financing companies ask me to change the ethnicity of the film, Thai, Korean, Chinese, Japanese even. Um, but I refused to do that because mm -hmm. I, Good. this is <laughs> this is what I want. And um, I've had a lot of distribution companies run the statistics or like the numbers on it, like what, what can we do with this cast of Filipinos? And I had people convince me that like, I need at least one white male in the movie so that we can make our money back. Um, hmm. You know, That's I, crazy. Yeah, so I did write in a, a white male and I understand that this is the way that businesses see it. Mm -hmm. And if that's just the way it's gonna be for now, fine, I'll let that happen. But it's a like 99% a Filipino cast with one white male so we could sell it. Tell me it was Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> well, we haven't made it yet, so <laughs> right now in development, and then we're going to start casting. But yeah, that'd be good. yes. You'll Ryan just Reynolds. see Walter yeah. Talon's pop in. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, hmm? <laughs> is that your man crush? It is my man crush. I will yes. admit, yeah. You're blushing. I love it. I, love it. I no true story. Like, oh my God. Do, you, do you guys want to story Ryan yes. Reynolds story time? Yes. I was uh, I was working the red carpet, and that, that was because we were talking about it earlier before you came on. Um. <laughs> And I was interviewing him, and my my cameraman was like, uh, he was like, after Ryan Reynolds walked away, he was all, it's like, hey man, you you're you're giddy like a schoolgirl, and then you're like, and I'm like, oh yeah, God. dude, it's Ryan Effin oh Reynolds, and he's like, <laughs> you know, he's cool, he's he's Van Wilder. This was before Deadpool, yeah. And uh, and I just looked at him, and he's just he was like, and my cameraman was like. Yeah, I was I was giggling like schoolgirl behind the camera too. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you can't help it. <laughs> I'm mean, like, hey, you know what? We're secure with our sexuality that we can say that. <laughs> there you go. Oh that's, God, that's right. right. That's right. Yeah, we were like, hey, he was a cool dude. Uh, what about the other Ryan though, Gosling? Are you feeling that, or is I, that not even? He's got those lashes, man. Yeah. No, nah, no. Nah. That's a no? lot. He's cool. He's a good actor. <laughs> I'm just. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, he's. Yeah, he's, he's, he's high. 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 He's high. <laughs> <laughs> he's cool. oh still God, love so funny. Still love you. Like, yeah. who, who would be your your dream cast for that? As, um, as honestly, far as that that character. Um, honestly, right now, I mean, we've got a list going, but I I think that I really want to do like uh for the female role that it's it I want to find her, you know. Like, I don't think there's anyone who's pure Filipina that exists right now in the in the American. Oh, we know somewhere. quite a few. That's yeah. what Phil Lamb craves that's for. That's right. Girl. Exactly. That's I mean, right. like, I, I would like to get a white male. Obviously, that's known. There's a list of, like, 100 guys that we have. Um, <laughs> but my focus is on the Filipina. Like, I want her to be the star. And I think it's going to be kind of like a an American honey where we get, like, a Sasha Lane that's, like, found on the streets or, you know, somebody who's just, like, out there and hasn't just not been discovered yet. All right, Phil Lamb awesome. creative folks. 
Yeah. She's going to have auditions in the near future. Start working on it. Exactly. (laughs) We'll just pop our heads in. Quick cameos. (laughs) I'd be like, you want savage jungle and i was kidding <laughs> we come in a pair yeah <laughs> as long as we're like now. in twin head hun- headhunters <laughs> headhunters <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. like, how how do you go about your casting um well for phobias right now uh we're going through all the agencies mm. so uh you know ca is like sending us all our you know all their picks and UTA and all their all their companies. Um, one of our producers is rep with CA, so he just oh, cool. calls them up and then they send us a list. Uh, same thing for Rise. Um, yeah, through the agencies. Nice. Yeah. Going back to HBO, how has your life changed since winning HBO or getting third third place? Right. Mm-hmm. Third place. Yeah, it's been a lot. Like we are doing interviews almost every day, lots of meetings, uh, a lot of attention. It's just uh, being in front of people a lot. Uh, I was used to that back then, you know. Okay, so I did this YouTube video that got like millions of hits when I first moved to LA um, and I took it off the internet so no one can watch it anymore. But, you know, this is when YouTube was just starting to get big and I was contacted by so many people. but there were so many negative racist things about me being Asian oh my God. that wow. it was overwhelming. It was like, I couldn't believe how much people were racist against Asians. I kept hearing like, you're a chink, you're a dirty chink, whatever, you know? And I was like, I have to close this down. I can't take this, like, this hatred is so, it's so much. Um, but I, that's why I, at that point in time, I started shutting down from being in front of people. Mm. And that's why I was like, I'm going to be behind the camera now. And now that I'm in front of it again, it's it's strange to like be seen again. Um, but I'm happy that it's on HBO and I'm not on YouTube where there's a lot of people that are just talking crap constantly. Um, it's, it's really fulfilling right now and really awesome to be able to share what we're doing. And um, But it is a lot of interviews. It's been fun though. Well, you're on that team, no sleep. So yeah, exactly. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. How do you? How do you? Because I, 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 we've talked about this before. Because I have I have some stalkers out there. Yeah. <laughs> and so how how do you uh, deal with it now with the negativity and or you know people just being weird towards you or. Um, um yeah the stalker stuff i kind of just have to like block from facebook or or uh, instagram and stuff like that i I, ch- I choose not to talk to any racist negative people anymore before i would try i'm like well, well, you really, you, you really <laughs> actually <laughs> tried it much, you know <laughs> Don't I'm be like, racist. You're so sweet. <laughs> i mean this is futile but that's like when youtube was like popping you know people were just putting their stuff out and i was like me making talk them into loving me or loving asians <laughs> and understand that you know it's it's stupid like people are just gonna hate and want to hurt you and say stupid things for attention so there's no point well, now yeah then or they're just like in an unhappy place in their own personal lives or yeah own, it's so. a true reflection of yeah. who they are how do you handle it um well at first it was really weird because uh y- you know like <laughs> i don't even know if i want to it, go there so, go there so, someone is using my my Older photos, oh, not no. even older, uh, to try to catfish men no, out there. Weird. Old men. <laughs> it's not me. They're guys. not that old. It's not me, Walter. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> it's not me. <laughs> and literally, like, they're trying to use my photo to extort money from no. like these old white guys. No. And then they find they hunt me down, <gasps> and like they like find me. They're like, oh hi, back. you know, I found you, and I'm like, who are you? And then they oh screenshot, and so that's why like like I have to ask people. <laughs> oh my <laughs> like, god. Like how do you? Because at first, because uh, I was in the military before, and they're trying to impersonate uh, somebody who works for Department of Defense, mm-hmm. oh my god. and they use parts of my real history. Uh, and fabricated a story. Oh my god! And that's a that's a felony, guys. You don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's so creepy. So, and all my social media is on lockdown, 
Uh, it's okay. private, so you know I gotta approve y'all out there. Yeah, but, it, yeah, it's scary. You know, I can't even imagine somebody making a racist comment towards me because I'm just weirded out. Like, should I be flattered, guys? Like, yeah. you're using not that great of a photo, but hey, yeah. it's cool. <laughs> like, I don't know, but yeah, it, it's it's so awkward to, you know, it's one thing to be in, you know, you you have this platform that you can use for so many great things and then there's like these weird people out there who just want to be a part of it yeah and make weird ass comments and then try to tear you down and then like they make all these assumptions and i don't know it's just i mean weird. that's they get their attention from that sadly and yeah. uh yeah it's a psychosis and but going back to that impersonating military like you know psa for folks that's oh, a yeah. real mm -hmm. scam yeah uh, on a lot my, of dating websites too and my mom actually forwarded me a profile because her friend was getting messaged by this guy he's pretending to be like a white male soldier like forwarded like photos of him in his dress uniform and like other like saying he's in a military blah 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 and then, oh, all of a sudden, something's wrong. He needed some money mm -hmm. uh, for it and remitted to him or something like that. Wow. Uh, and my mom was like, sent me the picture. I was like, hey, does this sound, you know, does this sound legit? Like, oh my God. And I was like, so what's, scary. yeah, and I was like, what did he say? And like his rank. And I was like, no, like the photo is not even the same rank. They're not even the same service because right. the woman didn't know, right. uh, you know, anything about the military. And so she and she was like an older, you know, woman and being romanced by this older, you know, white male soldier, whatever. And he was like to her, just like, oh, he's a soldier. Like, no, that's I. this sounds like a scam. Wow, that's yeah. so creepy. So apparently my fake profile out there is um, I have an 18 year old daughter. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm 21, but I have a 14 year old daughter that oh I'm sending God. to boarding Whoa. school. Out in London. I live in what? Florida. Oh, <laughs> nice. I'm not good Florida. at math, but how old yeah. are you? <laughs> you <laughs> the kid? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> who up? believes this crap? Yeah. Who? I don't even know. And yeah, like, I, I mean, it's like on uh, multiple websites, apparently. Oh, no. Yeah, and I'm just like, man, these people are like trying to find me on my LinkedIn. <laughs> like, oh, it's got to stop. Oh, I know. It's but hard I just block. I, like, I just block because I don't know what else yeah. to do. Like, I'm, I've been blocking, but it's like they're also like, you have to open up all your social media so that you can push this movie. And I'm like, all the crazies come out. Right? No. <laughs> I mean, I guess like you could always just do one for that project, right? I could also just do like a fake profile of me. I mean, it's like, it's, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? Like, these are my, this is my, my uh, outward life, but yeah. all my personal stuff just needs to stay. <laughs> so what has been the most surprising thing about meeting other people in the industry through HBO? Uh, well, it was really amazing that night because Sujata Day from Insecure and Leonardo Ooh. Nam from Westworld. I mean, we got to spend some time with them and talk with them and uh, just kind of like sit down and be like, oh, so you're up to Westworld, cool, Insecure, amazing. And they're, you know, interested in what I'm doing. And I'm, I'm actually going to meet up with Sujata next week and we're going to talk about projects, which is ah, amazing, you know? Nice. So Congrats. Uh, it's, it's been really cool to, oh God, one of the coolest e uh, email I got was from like the president of HBO saying, welcome to the HBO family, which is like, ah, uh, <laughs> my brain explode. I can die now. But I mean, that's, that's really just a dream come true to be able to say I'm part of the HBO family. That's crazy. That's awesome. That's crazy. And amazing. So I just want to keep going and, and work more with HBO and pitch them my show. <laughs> yeah, girls on your yeah. dream board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on dream board. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, y'all have to make dream boards out there and then they work. everything will happen. They, it will, yeah. It will I mean, you actually place. have to do something every day towards it, but yeah, they do work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, I, I just want to say thank you very much for coming and visiting us. Uh, but before we wrap up, can if you want to share your social media, how people can follow you or follow your uh, shorts or your features cool. and your films and whatnot. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And you can follow me at Marty Go, which is so funny. We're like, don't follow me, but follow me <laughs> at Marty Go. And um, you can watch HBO uh, on HBO, my short film called Remittance. So basically, you can watch Marty Go at HBO Go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So HBO Go. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was made for me, guys. It was there made you go. <laughs> you were meant to win. Yeah. <laughs> so again, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, 
I wish you the best of luck and everything. And so go check it out. Go check her film out, Remittance, on HBO platforms. Uh, and next, we are going to have Melanie Ramos uh, for her film, uh, Limbo Land. So come check us out. And here's some messages from our friends and sponsors. Film Am Creative presents the fourth annual Hollywood Actors Panel, a panel discussion and networking event featuring our special guest industry panelists who represent the craft of acting across the board. 2018 industry guest panelists include John John Briones, recently played Modessa Kunanen in FX American Horror Story, Ginger Gonzaga, actress, currently plays Dana in NBC Comedy Champions. Reggie Lee, actor, played Sergeant Wu for six seasons on MC's Grimm. Ellen D. Williams, actress, currently plays Nicole in the Emmy Award-winning FX comedy, Baskets. Join us Saturday, June 9th, 2018, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the Filipino Workers Center at 153 Glendale Boulevard, Los Angeles, California, 90026. Get your tickets on Eventbrite. Look up fourth annual Hollywood Actors Panel. See you there. And welcome back, guys, to Phil Am Creative's Voices, LA Asian Pacific Film Festival Megapod. I'm Walter, and this is Arlene. Howdy. We're the host of Voices, and we have Melanie Ramos, who is the writer and director of a film called Limbo Land. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Guys, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more? Sorry. It's so hot in here right now. I swear, if you see my powers, please just hashtag powers power and screenshot that shit. Um, so, That's a anyhow, can you tell us a little bit more about Limbo Land? Uh, cool. Yes, I can. Limbo Land um, <clears throat> is a short film that I did for my MFA, um, and it's about an estranged father and daughter um, that. Uh, come together for her mother's funeral so she comes back and she finds that uh, her father kind of was not doing his job and the uh, funeral home misplaces the body and so together they have to kind of like go on this journey to find the body and then as they're on this journey they kind of deal with their issues their underlying issues of why like she left and why their relationship kind of is not the best nice that's so uh, true of like every <laughs> Filipino funeral, <laughs> wedding, whatever, party, major, you know, event that happens. But I, I see that a lot, um, or and I hear about that a lot with family dynamics of Filipino families. Yeah. And so how did you come up with this concept? Um, the concept was, uh, let's see, it was, it was actually one of my, like, first film ideas, like, in uh, grad school. And it was actually, like, a, a road trip journey and that was supposed to be based in the philippines mm -hmm. um and it was i just was like had this idea of how like people have coming out stories right and then um when they come out they all they have to come out multiple times to their families and it's kind of that struggle with sorry the struggle with uh your parents you just want to you don't want to tell them so many times but they never like they don't want to listen or they're in denial and this was kind of that uh it comes to a, like a boiling point in this story where she, they kind of she wants to say it for the last time so that they could have this relationship after like not talking for a really long time and um who was the your actress or who your main character who was the your actress for your movie uh, the actress for my movie, her name is Amy Lynn Avalara. She does like a lot of uh, theater, mm -hmm. and she was oh she came in for the first time, and she just like like did the read for the role, and I was like automatically I was like you're it, you're the one, you're the like, oh, nice. you're the grace in my film, and then um, yeah she's great. It just like it was so easy to like work with her, and it was like we had a connection because we had kind of have the same story. Um, cause she could really connect to that story as well. So was the casting process, uh, would you say was that easy for the rest of the cast or it was, uh, is actually for the dad, it, it was almost the same thing. Um, his name is, uh, Vladimir Velasco. He came in as well and like, he just read the page and it was so weird cause it was just, it was a weird casting call cause it was just me and my brother. He just came to like support me 
and like the 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 character is kind of like based on my my own father. So like he read on the page, and we've like both looked at each other. And we're like, oh my god, this is like our dad. <laughs> it's so weird, dad? but it was like it was perfect. And he was like, it was it was great to have like them both perfect for the role. And then they came to read. Um, they came to my house to read uh, this the most important scene, like the like climax scene. I was like, all right, I'm just gonna give it to you. See how it goes. And it was like. It, would, it got like really loud and my apartment was like so small and I was like, I hope nobody gets mad. But it was like, it was perfect. Like they were just like, they had really good chemistry and like you felt the relationship between them. Um, for the other people, it was, for me, it was really hard because I wasn't as connected to the Filipino American community here in LA. Um, so I had put stuff on like the casting calls at like, uh, I forget what those casting, regular casting calls, and I was getting nobody. I put like Filipino American, um, like 20 something for, or wow. like a 40 something woman, and then like another 20 something guy, and I was getting like no hits. And so then, you went to those web, the 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 casting websites, and yeah, like general casting, yeah, and, and put out like a breakdown, and I was like barely getting anything. It was amazing, and then like actually, I went on to like a film, the film creative, like the group. Mm -hmm on Facebook and I just put out like one blast and I was getting like so much feedback from people, That's especially awesome. for like aunties. Like there was no aunties for some reason. And I was like, I just need one, <laughs> just one. And I was getting people from actually like, Facebook is amazing. Cause like he reaches everybody from like different parts of the country. And I had like a lot of friends that were, um, in New York and mm -hmm. they like shot it out to their friends and that's how, how I found my like auntie yeah. she's actually from New York and she like flew all the way over here to like be in my film wow, wow. she was like perfect too like she was that auntie is also based on my auntie which is like that really uh, quirky charismatic auntie I don't know if you guys have one of those yeah everybody's got one of those <laughs> yeah. so like <laughs> she came in and she was like she read or she actually sent me a video and I was like perfect you're like it was it was pretty much like really great. All the people that came in, they were just like, I could see you definitely being that person. And two of our Philam Creative members yes. made it in. Yes, <laughs> Sheila Teh uh, Te Tejada, Tejada. Tejada. Mm -hmm. and then uh, Jeff Gadigan. Yes. Yeah, they were really great. Jeff is amazing. Like he just came on, and he just read the part. And he's also based on like all my cousins put together. Like the social media hungry like cousin <laughs> that wants to take like Instagram pictures at like funerals. So I was like, Perfect. oh geez, <laughs> like it's so funny. Like he has other like scenes I had to cut out because it just didn't fit right. But like he put, he was really great. And then Sheila was really, she had great chemistry with uh, Amy Lynn and it was just like, they played a really good couple. Um, and we had like this talk <clears throat> um, before like, you know, just background between the two of them. And they were like making up their whole relationship. And it was like, I was like, okay, go ahead. You guys got it. Like, I was like, I wish I had a relationship like that. It was like really good, really good. Yeah. And so, how much of this story is like autobiography, uh, autobiography, or whatever? Like, how, how much of this is you? Is it all you? Uh, I think like the characters are very based on um, me and like people I know. Like the dads, like kind of based on my dad. The Grace is based on like characteristics of me, and then like as I said, my auntie and uncles and stuff like that. Um, but uh, like the story is not like, is not based on anything, mm -hmm. but it was just based on the idea of like, you coming out once and then again, you gotta come out like multiple times to your parents. And you, this is just like one final like coming out story. Cause I always see uh, coming out stories and it's like, what happens after? Like mm -hmm. what happens after that? Um, and like, they're like, oh, you either get like, what do you got? Cut uh, off, yeah, right? Ostracized. You get cut off and then so like she leaves or something or like, yeah, it's great. But like, That's true. when is it ever like great? Yeah. It's never like that. Yeah, because everybody takes, um, you know, the the coming out news so differently. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's so fascinating because everything you're saying, my gay best friend growing up, he... I don't even know why I just like never put it together. Like my gaydar is horrible, right? Like I just like have like no gaydar. And um, and like I just thought, oh, he's like been brought up by like all these strong women and his dad was always like on a ship somewhere and you know, he's kind of gone a lot. And uh, and all throughout high school, you know, he, he, he never came out. But like everyone around us is like, no, he's gay. I'm like, no, 
he has a strong presence of women in his family. <laughs> and so finally, we were going uh, up to UT in Austin. That's where he was going to school, and we were traveling up from San Antonio. And he's like, Arles, I have to tell you something. And I was like, yeah, what? He's like, I'm dating someone. And I was like, oh my God, who is she? And then he goes, it's a man. And I was like, oh, who is he? Like, I, I mean, like it didn't, I just loved him for him. So it, it never really mattered. Yeah. But when I told my mom, because my mom was like, oh my God, when he gets married, that woman is going to be the luckiest woman. He's a really great guy, mm -hmm. fabulous guy. And, um, and I was like, no, mom, he's bakla. Like, he... He, he's into dudes, you know? And she's like, no, when he gets married to a woman, I'm like, mom, like, <laughs> I had to crazy. like tell her over and over. And, and I feel like when my friends um, who have come out to their families, like it's the same yeah. repeat. It's it like is shocking. Like, it's I like, think, yeah, it's oh. weird too. Cause like my dad is from that generation, like baby boomer generation. Mm -hmm. So like everything that's different is not good. So mm -hmm. it's like, I think a lot of people that like come over, they're just like, Everything it, and Filipinos are like denial until like it's you're uh, like confronted. It's in it. your face. Yeah, and like nobody ever is just gonna go. Oh, I'm just gonna make out with my girlfriend right in front of your face, right? You still have that respect for them, so like it'll never come to light until like you know you have this point where in this story it's like they no longer have that kind of bridge, which is the mother. So like he has to like somehow not accept it right away, but come to an understanding or yeah. an openness to like start a conversation. Come to terms with it. Yeah. And work. Which, and I, you know, that, now that you bring that up, when I do see movies with, uh, you know, gay themes or coming out themes, and it's like, you're right, it is the ones I've seen. It's like, it's always the lead up to it, the drama mm -hmm. of revealing yeah. yourself. But it's not, yeah, it's like, oh, what if they still don't get it or they don't want to accept it i mean i think there's a few out there maybe but yeah that's a, i never really thought about that and you're right um and i just totally smacked my lips <laughs> <laughs> control yourself control yourself um, um, walter tell us yeah there you go <laughs> okay let's just lose my train of thought um, <laughs> no, it's just, and, and it's it's interesting. I, I've had friends growing up also. Um, the very first time I had someone come up to me, and I again, I don't knowing what I know now. I don't know if I did it right, but it was like it was in college, and we were taking a uh, going back home from college, and he was he was my ride, and we stopped and at we were eating lunch, and he just told me, he's like, hey, uh, you, you know, I'm I just want to tell you that I'm gay. And I just looked at him, and I was like, oh, I've known. <laughs> and he was like, what? He was like, a shock. And I'm like, that's cool, dude. Like, and, and I don't know if I, that was right for me to say it like that, but we kind of, as friends, we were like, uh, we, you know, we had a, I grew up in San Francisco, so I, I would say I have a pretty good gaydar. And I, I think we all knew and accepted him for who he was long before he accepted himself. Mm -hmm. And he's like, are you cool with it? I'm like, yeah. And I was like, whatever, man. And and it, this is a part where I like, and I'm sure a lot of guys have said this in the past, like, yeah, as, as long as you don't hit on me, bro. Like, you know, <laughs> oh that kind God. of <laughs> that kind of answer. I mean, I I'm not, I wouldn't say that anymore. But like, but for the I would be age, offended if yeah. they didn't hit on me. Come on, girls. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, that's in a way that now that I'm like, hey, so. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> I'm not not that I'm in. I just want to know. Like, yeah. <laughs> but no, it was cool. Like, um, and I told him, I was like, "Hey, man, like, we've known. We just, you know, when you were comfortable, when you're ready, and we're just like, whatever, man. I'm, you're still like, you're still part of our, you know, circle or group of friends. Like, we're not gonna kick you out or anything like that. But I, I understand that's not." for that's not what happens with everyone. Right, mm -hmm. and I think it's great to show that perspective of how difficult it can be for other family members to accept, not accept, borderline. There, It's it's kind of like a confusion state of like what to do. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's great that you're able to like showcase all of that within your film. Thank you, thank you. I also was like, 
uh, the aunt, she keeps like pushing on like boyfriends. I don't know if you guys watch, but she keeps <laughs> pushing on boyfriends. But like her background was like she knows she's just kind of like ur- like urging a, like urging her to like okay, just let me know because we all know we just want you to tell us. So it's like some people want to know and just want to like be more open about it, and some people are just like in denial. You just have to kind of I don't know. Always op- It's all about opening up the dialogue between the two of you and you can't mm-hmm. i mean i just urge like parents to like you know acknowledge it and hopefully you know you could keep that relationship with your you know i was gonna say sibling your daughter or son you know it's they they love you just as much and they probably just respect you as much and not you know they just want to have a conversation with you they don't like want the like complete acceptance right away has your family seen the film? They have not. My brother did at the theater. Oh, cool. Um, he was there. He got, like, the last seat in the house in the front. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. He was like, I was getting dizzy. I had to leave. Uh, he's like, but I watched your film. Way to hook up the family. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't they usually have reserved yeah. seating? No, for, the, uh, the thing was, I said, hey, guys, uh, buy a ticket. And then I didn't expect that the, the seating was going to get like rush or like sold out because I was like Tuesday night nine o'clock queer program I'm not quite sure that's going to be like full and then um the day of in the morning it said rush and I had like texted everybody or I put on my Instagram I said rush line guys you gotta like either buy your ticket now or just wait earlier and then a whole bunch of people came and it was like sold out i was like are you kidding me this is crazy like a sold out crowd's gonna see my movie this is not i was like really nervous about it how was it for you being in the theater and hearing and seeing all the reaction from everybody oh yeah i was like super conscious i was just like (laughs) shaking the whole time and like cringing like everything in my body was like super tight and all the words i was just like repeating in my head why did i write that (laughs) (laughs) but i got some laughs and i like i was like the whole night i just wanted like one or two laughs, and I'd be like, suffice with the how it went. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, how many other festivals did you submit in to? Uh, I did a like a lot more festivals, but I just got in t- as well to uh Campfest. So I'll be at Campfest awesome. um, next week on Congrats. Tuesday. Congrats! Thanks. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I'll be yeah. in San Francisco. Watch for it. That one. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's. I'm betting you're gonna fill the house with that. I hope so. Yeah. So, um, and then going back, like, um, when you're writing this and, you know, like you were saying it's not really based on anything, um, but in, for your own personal experience, uh, like how, how much, how much did it affect your writing though with, yeah. The whole thing? Yeah. A lot. I think the whole relationship with the father daughter is like, is definitely me and my dad. He's like that super stubborn, like baby boomer type that has all like, his own perspective on life and he's like super religious so um a lot of the things that he was saying is exactly what would come out of my dad's mouth um and then a lot of things that i was or grace was saying is what i would come out of my mouth um so it was like very personal to me that's why i was like really out of all the films that i have screened before this one really like was i was super nervous about because like all the words like meant a lot to me yeah, I can imagine. I mean, how hard is that putting yourself out there? Oh, it was like, yeah, exactly. What I was saying earlier, I was just like cringing the whole time. I was like nervous that people are going to hear my words and then like hear my story, right? What was some of the feedback from uh, people in the theater that came up to you or like during the Q&A? What have they said specifically to you that stands out? Um, nothing like super... Uh, or even that surprising. I remember, surprise. Um, nothing. I don't. I can't think of anything. I didn't. People were just. A lot of people really liked it, which I was. I'm just like kind of stunned when people were like, "Oh, you watched it?" Like, <laughs> uh, what's her name? Uh, Martigo was like, "Oh yeah, people are talking about it." I was like, "What?" Like, people are talking about my film. That's crazy. Um, I'm just surprised that people are talking about it. But um, I haven't heard any like other feedback other than it's just like it's really good. It's funny. Um, and then like people were like, they get, I, I was like promoting as like, come and laugh and then cry. And they're like, what? Cause at the end it's, it gets a little serious and as you know, it touches like the heart a little bit at the end there. 
and I guess what would your uh, what would you say was your inspiration in general as a filmmaker? And then like for this, were were there any specific films that kind kind of inspired you? Uh, for this film, like uh, I was really inspired by Death at a Funeral, and then like I was just inspired to write a story about like queer Asian women or queer Filipino women because mm-hmm. I don't see much of those. I saw like one last year at like Outfest, and then. Like I don't see much of them at all. So like I just yeah. wanna like see me up there or see people like me, you know, brown queer women. Right? Which is so interesting because in the Philippines I feel like, you know, being gay is so open and it's so accepting and I mean like I feel like there there's such a, a big community here in the States and you're right, like you, we don't get to see as many films yeah. as, you know, someone who's not Filipino. And yeah. so I hope you continue to make all your films <laughs> <laughs> towards that because those stories do need to be heard. They're so yeah. important. And and, uh, it, and I feel like for a lot of people who are not in major cities, that would definitely help out. Because even in, I mean, San Antonio is a much bigger city now. Um, it was so hard for a lot of my friends to come out, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s. It was so tough. But then, you know, when... when I mean, like, of course, like Will and Grace, everybody loves Will and Grace. <laughs> you know, like more shows were becoming a little bit more mainstream. Uh, it, it was fantastic to see that. Like a, as a friend, to see someone come out and that relief, um, yeah. that weight off of them, like it was so much joy to see mm-hmm. that. Like to me, I was like, that was, I'm like, you can tell me again and again. <laughs> you know, like that, to me, that's so important. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, I think that I read an article recently that Philippines was rated like the most tolerant country uh, for LGBTQ. Uh, I believe that. And uh, and uh, but going back to what you're saying about the like people of color representation in in gay films, or uh, I don't know what's the right term, <laughs> or queer. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, L- yeah, LGBTQ. LGB. It's just so long to say. LGBTQIA. <laughs> <laughs> we just hey, have like, we're <laughs> army. We're, we're used to <laughs> long <laughs> um, Like, is from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong. Like, there, there's just not much, right? It's mostly the the story of like white male yeah. experience, kind of thing. Yeah. And why do you think that might be? Um, I just think that it's everybody's just used to that. Like I was just at this uh, reading at Cinema Sala and they were talking about how it was like a full Filipino written script. It wasn't about creepy, it was just full Filipino script, but she was shopping it around and they were accepting it, but they were like, oh, we just want them to be white. It's just like, they just want nice. brown people to be like white. Even the story is universal. Like for some reason, like they just can't see like Asian people or brown people as like a uh, like a lead character. So it's like it's like just hard to see your yourself on screen and I don't know. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I I just don't know. It's just like I just think it's just the stigma that people just don't want to see that they don't not they don't want to see it is that people don't put them in the forefront. And you only see yeah. them like in independent films or short films or they're like the side character, the mm-hmm. funny character, but they you know, so it's like I don't know, we just have to keep making more stuff that makes it like, a, we're there, we're yeah. here, and we're good at acting, we're good at stories. It's just like, you gotta put yourself out there. What advice would you give to to people who have not come out, who are trying to make films and to overcome that fear of of not being accepted or tell it, telling the story? Telling the story? Oh man. I say just do it like I feel like I when I was first like just questioning myself like I was like I need to see stories about me and I'd go to YouTube and there's like nothing there but now it's like it's everywhere there's like all this like queer content and there's brown people like especially on YouTube um but like you just have to tell the story like for me it was about like I need to get this out of my chest like I need to write it down because it's been in my mind for a really long time that like for as a like filmmaker it's like i just have to get it out like yeah. you're not you're going to be stuck in that like i would say hell but you're going to be stuck in that bubble if you don't like release even if you're just writing it down write it down and then you could shoot it on a phone mm-hmm. you know find somebody or find yourself like just vlog it like no matter what you're doing you you have to make the content um and then you know express yourself 
as an artist, you should be expressing yourself all the time. Who was your inspiration then growing up because there was the lack of uh, content and lack of people telling those types of stories? So who inspired you and what was it about them that inspired you? Man, it's, it's hard because there's not a lot. There was like nobody there. But, yeah. um, and it doesn't see. have to be, you know, anybody on TV, just people in your life. Like who, in who inspired life. you to pursue this route? Oh, to pursue this. Actually, my dad is like helped yeah. me to pursue this route because he like oh, introduced good. me to like, you know, editing. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to make film. I was like, I'll be a filmmaker. And then, um, which was weird to say, like when you're 16. And then um, I went to film school and my mom was like, against it the whole time she's just like <laughs> you should be a nurse and i'm like i hate science i don't get it was um oh yeah. sorry go no ahead. go ahead go ahead oh, was your dad a filmmaker too or uh no my dad's like a he's like an engineer like a he, he just loves like tinkering with computers and stuff mm. like kind of like an engineer um he just loves uh in, computers and stuff and then like our church had this uh Com or sorry computer had like an editing system and like oh, video wow. system so like he was just like into that for a while he That's just like high he gets like hobbies yeah oh, he, gets, man, man. he gets hobbies and then he goes like to another hobby yeah. so like this was his hobby for a second and then i started just like messing around with it and like he just introduced me to that and i just like never put it away since just like keep going trying to learn new things with like film your dad was in a band at one point too didn't he <laughs> Uh no, but he's like great at karaoke. Oh, he's 100. like yeah. I literally like wake up when I was a kid every Saturday morning to this dude singing like uh like yesterday or something like that. Nice. I'm like, good choice. <laughs> but where'd you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Sacramento, California, oh, okay. in like South Sac oh. or Elk Grove, like people call it. Go represent. Yep. <laughs> and then what? And was it filmmaking that brought you down here to L.A.? Uh, yes, originally I went to, I went to undergrad here, um, it, actually in San Diego, um, uh, for film, and then I went back to Sacramento, and then I went to grad school. I actually lived in Singapore wow. for three years nice. doing grad school, and then I came back, and I was like, my friend's like, okay, I'm going to LA. I was like, just super nervous about it. I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm ready for that, and he's like, I'm getting an apartment, you should come, and I was like, okay, fine. So then I just came down, and I just kind of was here for like a really long time doing nothing, and trying to find jobs, it was mm. super difficult, um, especially coming out of school because nobody knows you, and you go to school like you went to school in Asia. Like, who are you? Um, and then, yeah, just trying to do film for like the last four years. Oh wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just the tran transplanting yourself from Singapore to here. Yeah, I mean, it was hard enough for me. I mean, I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Like, just from San Francisco or New York or Florida or whatever and then come in here but so is Singapore like crazy rich Asians oh my god when I saw that I was like oh that place oh that place it's like oh, super familiar oh, yeah cool. like all the stuff it is super clean it is there is a lot of rich people there and um but I did not see that like real rich rich people um uh, but there was a lot of like well off affluence people. yeah I heard it's beautiful it's there. really great it's really great and the food is amazing amazing just don't spit or chew gum right? yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah or graffiti <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh i just want to say like real quick that uh she melanie was like the first person that like hit me after we filmed uh or finished and aired our episode she hit she she ran into me at the gym like she, i was taking her um crossfit class and uh <laughs> yeah. yes. she was she she was like you're in that voices podcast oh, dude. What? And i was like what <laughs> and i was like i felt so special and she's <laughs> she knows uh aj and yeah. you know so she, um and she watched our show and she you know she was you were great i really and i just want to say again like i really appreciate you like letting me know that you watched it and that you know and giving like even the small critiques but like just being a pre i just appreciate you for just watching it and like following us yeah so. it's great you guys have like really good content um like i love listening to uh i forgot what her name was but she was the nbc diversity oh um she Grace was really, yeah it yeah. was really informative too for people that want that are creatives and they're trying to get into these programs like you get that inside look 
and I I didn't even know there was like a Filipino like part of the person that was like ahead of the program. So it's like interesting. They are looking for diversity, and you're not like alone out there. Yeah, and I mean that that was the whole purpose and intent of this program, and you know why we're why it's a video and a podcast. Uh, but I, I do have a question. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. How is Walter at CrossFit? Oh. Oh. <laughs> He actually How's hasn't been form? there in a really long, well, in a while. Well, no, well, to be fair, like I was, uh, I, I was doing a, that one month uh, Groupon special. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I see. I see. It's all falling good. on a budget. No, well, there's a lot no, of people because uh, my usual gym is like I'm with at the jiu jitsu gym, and so yeah. like I'm just uh, cross training and like so you don't plateau, and we can go into the whole thing <laughs> okay. about <laughs> fitness, but it's like you know just changing up your workout routine so it's not you're you're, you're not doing, doing the same thing yeah, and yeah yeah and then like oh, so dang i just did it again. <laughs> <laughs> but crossfit is like you know it's, it's a good uh development it's like i do crossfit and yoga to subsidize sometimes my jiu-jitsu and kali because it 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 works your muscles differently and the quick twitch muscles and all yeah. that stuff elasticity so but enough about working. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, but before we wrap up, though, I just uh, first I just want to say thank you very much for coming and joining us, and congratulations on Limbo Land. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on going, go, showing at Campfest. Yes. Um, that's great. Before we go, let people know how they can follow you. What's your social media? Cool. Uh, you could follow me on Instagram at at Mel Ramos. Um, you. Uh, also like Facebook, it's just also Mel Ramos. Uh, find me, I have like the same exact picture as Instagram. I have a <laughs> camera in front of my face. Yes, I cover my face like a lot. So um, yeah, you just follow me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, and then I'll be at Camp Fest in San Francisco Tuesday at the, I don't know if this is playing before or after. Just throw it out there. Okay, <laughs> it's gonna be playing um, May 15th uh, at the Kabuki at yeah, 8.30. Awesome. Cool. I wish you the best of luck. I know. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> that was a really awesome conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you very much, Melanie, again. And you guys are in for a treat because you got to see her face without a camera in front of it. So watch and look at that right now. Oh, no. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> and uh, if you guys just hang on, we're going to have a few words from our sponsor, but. When we come back, we will have John John Gustavo, and he is the writer and director for uh, a movie called Just a Kid from Seattle. So hang, out, hang tight. We'll be right back. And thank you for coming, Melanie. Thank you. Bye. Calling all Dodger fans, mark your calendar for Tuesday, June 12th to celebrate Philippine Independence Day at Dodger Stadium with Phil Am Creative on the 9th Annual Filipino Night. Special event ticket packages include your ticket to the game, all you can eat Dodger food, and this exclusive Filipino Night Dodgers game. Tickets start at $70. Get your tickets soon because they will sell out fast by emailing us at info at philandcreative.org. See you at the game. Go Dodgers. You're going to the game, right? Cool. And welcome back to another episode of Film Creative Voices, where your hosts are Arlene Della Pena and... Walter Talens. <laughs> Today we have John John Augustavo. He's the writer and director of the latest short film, Just a Kid in Seattle. Welcome, John John. Oh, hello. Welcome. <laughs> Glad Welcome you can make it, man. Yeah, L thank long you. time no see. Yeah. A decade or so. Yeah, I heard you guys decade, uh, yeah. know each other, right? From the back in the days? Yes, we, we both went to Washington State University and uh, we had, uh, we, we were both in the Filipino American Student Association. Go FASA! We're still oh out God, there. I forgot about it being <laughs> FASA. Right? Wow. Our, our um, AAPI room or center. Forgive me, forgive me, Steve. Forgive me, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was a totally different place where they kind of put all the minorities because I think when we were they there, did. They put all the minorities together. It was like a less than one percent <laughs> Asian population. Wow. Yeah. So yes. like you know, I just said, hey, Asians, Latinos, right? Black people, Natives, just you're all in one spot. You're all in FASA or <laughs> yeah. in that little cultural. Yeah, it was just a little tiny yeah. little rooms together. Yeah. Oh. It was wow. like the minority room, but it was our room. So huh. yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess in other universities they have like a whole kind of like a wing or a building for the clubs right 
You guys just had a room. <laughs> you did just have kind room. of, yeah, yeah. Well, you guys talk about FASA. Um, how many PCNs did you do, John? <laughs> PCN. So we didn't have anything that was called PCN. What? We how do you did guys... have, um, oh my gosh, what was it called? I should know this. For guys. people who don't know what PCN is, called Filipino had, Cultural like, Nights, and a lot of the Filipino clubs have these plays and scripts. Oh, we just did all the like the island clubs and stuff, did something together, no? That's true. Like, yeah, because like uh, the Hawaiian club. Yeah, uh, we just do it all together. Oh, it's like a cultural festival and stuff like yeah. that. Well, we had something it was like with... the API festival. Yeah, like, like the that. other... We put us all together because awesome. there wasn't enough. <laughs> so like this right? Hey, we were there, right? Hey, we at least there. you guys were there representing. Yes. Did we yes. have something? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I, I can't. I just can't. So, so let's go back to your short film, uh, Just a Kid from Seattle. Yeah. What's, uh, for the audience, can you tell them what's, that, what's the movie about? Uh -huh. It's uh, about a kid from Seattle, surprisingly. <laughs> Um, it's just a coming of age story about a young man whose mother passed away mm -hmm. and he's dealing with that, uh, issue by trying to run away from Seattle and just in a like very simple day, he reconnects with what he likes about Seattle and decides he wants to stay simple enough. It's just a, it was a way to kind of showcase different parts of Seattle. I think that are not shown in the media. I think a lot of people who've seen it have been like, I didn't even realize this was in Seattle because it's like showing the South End and the Central District and the other parts that you would never ever see in the like touristy parts. Fifty Shades of Grey of the world. Oh, and yeah. The, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sleepers in Seattle and they're totally fine. But that's not fully the version of the city that I know. And mm. so, you know, growing up, I just think it's necessary to represent all the different parts. So it was a vehicle to showcase the city that I'm from and the parts that I know and the people I know and mostly people of color. Nice. So I've heard that you've had this love-hate relationship with Seattle. Is that true? <sighs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that's because like, the story itself is kind of loosely based on myself because obviously I moved to LA at some point in my life and I just moved back to Seattle a little bit ago. But it's, uh, you know, it just rains a lot. It's cloudy <laughs> a lot. And there's not a lot of people of color. And I grew up in different parts, but I ended up going to like a private school where there's like 10 uh, Asian Americans, there's like five black kids. It's like, it was very, and there's 1200 kids at the school. So it was like very, made you feel very different and not a good way. Mm. Uh, so I've always had this like weird relationship. So as I got older, I was like, I wanna get out of here and be around people like me. So like luckily I went to Wazoo and connected with like the Filipino club, uh, I was in a black frat, it was crazy. Oh yeah. I yeah. I remember, remember I was the guy in the step shows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I do remember. yeah, but like Seattle, yeah, I I've always got have love for Seattle because it's a great place to go, grow up, but I think it marginalizes its people of color a lot and puts them in one spot and then now with uh it blowing up and becoming super expensive, uh it's being sanitized of its culture a little bit and that's like oh. a really big thing to say, but I've spent the last year there now and I realized it's a lot different than what I remember. It's missing like Capitol Hill used to be when I was a kid. I used to go up there. It was like grungy. There was a taco time that was really gross. And it was just like a weird <laughs> place and it had a little bit of identity. And now it's just like really expensive condos and hipster, not even hipsters, just techies. And they can do their thing. Yes. Fine. But so my love hate has changed now in a different way. Like when I was younger, I just had bigger aspirations and I wanted to leave it. But now it's more like I don't recognize the place anymore. So that's kind of a weird yeah, no, I mean, I feel you on that. Like, I grew up in San Francisco, and Ooh, I, I the first one, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the original San Francisco, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I feel the same way. And now that I go visit, when I go back home or visit family, it's 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 very different from the San Francisco that I grew up in. So, uh, in Seattle, yeah, I mean, I guess I never when I when I did go visit, I just went to the touristy spots. And did you go to Dick's? Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, can you explain dicks? <laughs> this is a real thing. I'm like He's not, not even talking kidding. about the burger place. Uh, <laughs> no, it's like the famous like burger place in Seattle. It just has like a name that's very questionable to a lot of people, but it's actually really good. I mean, it is really good, cheap, yeah. like hmm. delicious burgers. And now they take debit cards. This is another thing. Wow. They, they've always been cash only. Yeah. Now they're like, they take debit cards. That's just weird. It's like the place you go at like 2 a.m. after right. a night out. Super and, greasy. And then everybody's there at yeah. Dick's eating burgers, fries, all that jazz. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, 
Yeah, it's been a while. We <laughs> should go. We should go. <laughs> Voices tour. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that'd be awesome. We should. I mean, that. Tacoma is even changing too. Like, oh, drastically. Yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. We were talking earlier, and I was saying. <clears throat> Because of how expensive, I mean, you think about Seattle, it's like little islands, so there's only so much space. And so with the influx of economy and wealth, it's raised rent, obviously, and people are looking for other places to live. And Tacoma used to be, in my opinion, because I'm from Seattle, I always look down on Tacoma. Tacoma to be was honest, hood, but guys. Ta- Tacoma was. <laughs> that was like the real Like hood. Seattle has like a hood, but I've always thought Tacoma was more. And, that, yeah. not, not, and <laughs> yeah, that's like not a good no, thing, but now even downtown Tacoma is like So it was like really San nice. Francisco meets Oakland, like that or Like Alameda of, and all that stuff. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> right? But it's, yeah, and I don't, I couldn't speak for Tacoma. I'm not from there, but I've just been there a lot in the last year, like checking it out. And it's really, the downtown is actually nice. So, it's super yeah. pretty, yeah. Yeah, I, I lived in the theater arts district mm-hmm. at my last duty station when I was at Fort Lewis, and uh, it, it was super nice, like super gentrified, and lots of expensive coffee shops and avocado and toast. And, oh wow! I, I mean, love I don't, those yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how it is now, uh, but when I went there, it was I think they just put up those new facades and they just re- renovated that whole downtown strip. Mm-hmm. But at nine o'clock, it was like a ghost town. Like you could film a zombie yeah. movie there. Yeah, it was dead. It's it's not. It's quiet. It's quieter in downtown Tacoma. I feel of like course. the the nightlife has always been up in Seattle, and people right. still travel up. So when you were um, <laughs> filming your movie too, though, in Seattle, like uh, or your your short, and what was that like? I mean, was it easy for you? Was uh, there's obviously any challenges. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, like physical production. It was just it was just physically challenging. It has nothing to do with the city not supporting it, or those or anything like that. We like we got pulled over by the cops a few times, but it's like I understand. We're driving. We were like the cars in it are very much the hood cars that you would expect. So I can see like yeah, they're gonna check what we're doing. Um, but we actually had a pretty reasonable support. Like all my friends helped us out. We were extras or in it, and we were able to shoot pretty much wherever we wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, I think just the hardest part is with this short, it was like part of a project with Sundance where the city of Seattle was paying for it. Oh, oh nice. So there's, ah, uh, it's nice to an extent. <laughs> oh. But when you are trying to have a very honest voice about what's going on and they're putting a lot of restrictions on what your story can be, it makes it hard to have it be fully honest. So while I'm happy and we made this coming of age and the hero is a Filipino American and these things, I think I was not forced, but asked to avoid a little bit of what I really wanted, wanted to recognize as happening, you know, yeah. from, without saying too much, but it's like police or Cause they didn't want it to hot be. button issues like gentrification or mm-hmm. marijuana, these types of things. And the homelessness is like very big in Seattle, mm-hmm. but I, will, I had to stay away from those. So really I just tried to make this warm coming of age story that happens to use the more or less hood as the backdrop. So at least you can see it but it didn't get to delve fully into it. Mm. Oh, wow. It's a complicated thing, and I'm, it was very difficult in terms of that. And with casting, uh, with Carlin James. Carlin. Carlin, we heart you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you find him? Mini-me. I call him Mini-me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Kind of looks like me, but I'm like a head yeah. taller than him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, He's like you when you were like 13. Probably. I think right? that's when I had a growth spurt. <laughs> he, um, it, and we actually found him through Dante Bosco. Oh, mm. nice. Of every, anyone. Uh, I just have no Dante. And from passing somewhere along the line, we met each other. And everybody who's Filipino knows Dante Bosco. And come on, yeah. he's Dante Bosco. Uh, but I was trying to cast this film. And I was like really rushed. Like, you know, Sundance was like, yeah, we want you to do it. We like your script or whatever. And then I tried to cast... Uh, in Seattle, impossible. Impossible, because there's not a lot of acting in Seattle, hmm. and the kids that I wanted to use were from the hood, but they just couldn't act. Hmm. They had the mannerisms, they were the kid. They had the character, they were everything about it, they just couldn't act. The moment you asked them to do lines or put them on camera, nothing. The Damn. personality was gone. And so then I started to, not like panic, but I was also like shooting like com- like two commercials back to it. It was like the worst. Uh, so I started asking friends who had done films with uh, like Filipino Americans, like, can you, helped me in New York, San Francisco, and still I couldn't really come up with a lot. Like I found one guy, but he was just too old. Like this guy from Oakland, he had a little bit more swagger to him. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but, you know, more or less this guy in the film is kind of a version of me. Uh, and I'm not special by any means. I just know it for an actor, a Filipino-American, like, Hapa actor who's kind of like alpha and tall is hard to find. It is very hard. I realized this on doing this. <laughs> it's so it's so wild to me because, like, you know, like, knowing you, you know, when you're 18 and, like, knowing Carlin, it, it's it's the perfect casting. Oh, right. Is that's it, what I say, like, right? <laughs> really? really like, well, yeah, so we, were, we couldn't find anybody. And then I, like, shot in the dark was, like, Dante, can you, do you know anyone or can you help me out? And he was just like... Uh, I don't know if I know anybody off the top of my head, but he's like, just did an Instagram post. He like did a thing and he recorded it. And then he just started to get people sending it in and he sent me Carlin and then I sent Carlin the script. And I was like, I mean, he seems right. You know, he had, he had a little more attitude. He photographed well, you know, he just wasn't your, like what I was getting before. I was getting a lot of like typical theater kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Carlin has a built in a little bit of attitude that I needed. So you know, I was happy to have him because everyone would say out of like hundred or so people who sent me stuff, he was the only one that was even relatively close wow. outside of like real kids who couldn't do, couldn't memorize a line or anything. Nice. Good job, Carlin. <laughs> Dante. <laughs> and thank you, Dante. Thank you, Dante. I said Dante Bosco. <laughs> uh, and then, so, because making your film, like does, did it make, does it make things easier being coming from Seattle and because you, for people that don't know, you're you know you're pretty well known for doing Macklemore's music videos, mm -hmm. and um, and being a hometown kid. Like, does that make things a little easier for like the people know you when they see you? Oh, I mean, people that I know know me. I don't. I mean, I can't imagine like some random person in Seattle would know me. That'd be weird. Um, <laughs> but it. I mean, it makes it easier maybe because I've made a lot of good friends along the way through the music scene. Mm -hmm who their network of people and their associations and stuff were able to help me make this a lot easier. And a lot of my friends who are musicians like are more plugged into different things than me or they're like younger dudes who I need a younger guy so they might know people that I didn't know. So through those associations, I was able to have an easier time filming this, but I don't think any of my associations with Macklemore otherwise helped me. I don't, I don't think so. And maybe if I was shooting in different parts of the city, it would help. Yeah. But I don't think in the South End, in the CD, anybody could care less about that. Oh, uh, well, yeah. I guess I was thinking more like also getting permits and all that stuff. Oh, no, Seattle's like, easy. It's like, they get, they, permits like $20. It's not like LA where they cost like $1,500 or something. Well, so we need to film in Seattle. I, I, and there's like, no, the film, moving there's this no whole film thing to Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like here you have someone show up and they make sure that nobody comes. They're, they're super chill about it. Wow. Yeah, like as long as you have insurance. It's great. And I, I do have a question about your music videos because yeah. you have such like raw, real people throughout, you know, various music videos that you've done. How do you go about getting them to do the video and, you know, because like you can tell they're not actors. Right. So how, did, how do you do that? Um, I think it's like, it's just creating comfort with people. I mean... Like I was just a minute ago, I had to do something on camera and I was really awful at it. <laughs> uh, but when you're having real people, yeah, there's a certain, I don't know what it is, but you just have to create a level of comfort or distraction and not try to get things that are too complex maybe sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just little tricks that you innately start to learn as you never, like when I started, I didn't get to use actors and stuff. So I had to use my friends and people I knew and you start to learn how do I get the best out of these people and then you just get better and better and I guess and you become a better people person I don't know they're just little things that I like innately I guess I'm pretty good at now when I deal with real people <laughs> uh -huh. and then when you come up with uh, your music videos I'm sure you get asked this often but uh, like how do you come up with the concept and the development of it is it you or the artist um, combination it, it's, yeah. it depends honestly you know like some artists are just looking for someone to make whatever whatever they want you know so that's like a, that's the dream process by the way is here's my song make whatever you want mm -hmm. yes uh and then there's definitely collaboration and there's people who want what they want and that's honestly they won't come to me because i'm not going to do what you say number one <laughs> but collaboration is okay that's film film is collaboration it's very hard to be like a little dictator in the film world so uh <laughs> when it comes to a video it's the song is will guide you pretty well. It's hard to have your own new idea and marry it to a song later. 
I mean, yeah. I definitely try. Sometimes I have like, I have an idea. <laughs> yeah. Someone says no, and then someone else says no. I was like, I'm going to keep pitching this. It works once in a while, but very rarely can you just have an idea that's already ready and slap it onto a song. So a lot of time it's just like, when you listen to it, uh, you'll have an idea. I mean, any of us would have an idea. And whatever your life experiences are and the things that you've learned, that will inform your decision when you hear the song. And then if the artist has their own idea, ideas, they usually share those beforehand. So those are already in the back of your brain affecting your thoughts. So mm-hmm. when all that comes together, you know, just have ideas. <laughs> Do you feel like there's a lot of um, Asian Americans, Filipino Americans that are are really prevalent and becoming more mainstream now? Because I feel like the, you know, like there's this huge Asian push in, in film and television music videos which is great but how do you feel at the the platform that you're at what do you see that's going on yeah and i would say there's like uh specifically filipino americans and you know i'm not the most informed person to be honest but i don't think it's that big of a thing still i mean there's a guy in like a show called like crazy ex-girlfriends maybe uh there's the sidekick in spider-man yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't know a lot, to be honest, and I don't know a lot of Filipino American directors. Uh, there's, I think that I have met along the way some that are more in like, um, not behind the camera, but just like maybe a writer or a creative something at Pixar, like those types of positions, but not really in the like hero positions, if you will, like the director, actor ones so far. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of that for Filipino Americans. There's a little bit more, and I think. Like Koreans right now are having a huge push. I know that a lot of my friends are Korean. Like yeah. down here, I just made, got like plugged into the Korean community, and they're just they're killing it. They've mm-hmm. started to cross over into American mainstream, which is really nice. But I don't think, uh, as far as our ethnicity, like Filipinos, I don't think we're. And I might be crazy, but you know, I, I feel like I would know. But I don't know if it's at that same level yet. I think it's a slower build right now. Yeah, and but, I mean, in your personal opinion, what would what do you think uh, will help get I mean, more and more people. I mean, this is like when we did the film the other day at the festival and it was a question like this. And it's like, honestly, like more people making things like I just made Mm -hmm. where you're not. The thing about my film is you have a Filipino kid. He's just a kid. He's not a Filipino. I mean, he's Filipino ethnically, but he could be a white kid. He could be a black kid. He could be a Latino kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he could have different interests than what we're stereotypically said we're supposed to do. We're not all like DJs, breakdancers, boxers, whatever you want to put it, not mailmen, uh, postmen, nurses, all those things. We're not all those. And so the more we start to make things where the character, as far as like what I do, is just more of a person that just happens to be Filipino, people will start to accept that more and not just see us as a stereotype. So you will get, then you'll start to see in my opinion, uh, people casting a Filipino guy to play the lead then, or he doesn't have to just be, you know, the more, even, even just Asians bigger, the more you have like Glenn, uh, Steven Yen on uh, Walking Dead, him playing like a different type of role, the more you're going to start to see that instead of us always being like the guy in Westworld. I don't remember his name. Oh, um, the Asian cat on there. Yeah, it's like kind of, he's kind of questioning it, but he's still like a scientist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's great. It's a big show, but I mean, the, the more we keep getting only to do that, the harder it's going to be still. So it's just like bit by bit, you have to keep creating these roles as far as film where we're not based around our ethnicity. And, oh, good. That's my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Growing up, um, were your parents pretty supportive of, of what you wanted to do? Since you were talking about stereotypes and, you know, kind of like the, the things that Filipino kids end up doing, right? Were they pretty supportive? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like I have like a very different Filipino upbringing because I wasn't brought up Filipino at all. Like my parents divorced when I was really young and I grew up with my dad. My dad's white. Mm. You know what I mean? So when I would hang out with my Filipino kids and they would do like, uh, what's it like, uh, there would be like, you go to like, uh, Dabu or whatever. And mm. it's like, I didn't know that stuff. It was very foreign to me. It was like, until I went to Wazoo, did I yeah. really start to understand <laughs> the stuff that's associated with how I look? Because before that, I was very much just growing up, like I said, just like a kid. I hooped a lot. Most of my friends were like black and white, you know what I mean? So I wasn't, I don't know. And it's like my parents were supportive, like my dad, but he was, it had nothing to do with being Filipino. That's the thing. Yeah. It was just like my dad's just a white guy and he was like, love you, dad. It's okay, you're white. Yeah. 
Um, uh, no, he was, but he was just supportive because he doesn't have those those things. And then my mom came here when she was like six months old. To be honest, she came from the Philippines when she was super young, and oh, she, yeah. she's, yeah. So she grew so up she's pretty much Americanized. Yeah, yeah, and her parents were those Filipino parents that were like, "Be American." Mm. She doesn't speak Tagalog even, and her parents barely spoke English. But they said, "Do not." They want you to. They wanted her to fit in. Yeah, and I'm, I wonder, but I'm sure my parts of my mom wishes she had more of that too. But we just, I didn't grow up that way, so my understanding of being Filipino has been a later bloom, I guess. Which, yeah, we um, in our earlier Megapod, we had Jeremy Sist- uh, Sistoso here, and she, he's half also. Yeah, and he was talking about how he, when he grew up, he, same thing. He didn't really identify with his mm. Filipino side until he got to college and later on, and like. Uh, I'm curious, like for you, what was that like when you got to Wazoo and like discovering and starting to discover your heritage or at least hanging out with other um, Filipino Americans? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Uh, I thought it was, you know, obviously it was really cool because it's like there's people that kind of look like me that are, uh, I mean, and I think I can almost like say is like, because I also didn't really grow up with my older brother. He was kind of like into like the more, not like even Filipino culture, but his friends were all like super like kind of like racer, kind of hood Asian kids. And I had this different version of like Filipino kids in Seattle, like the kinds that carried pistols and had tattoos and stuff. And Mm -hmm. they had like, they did cornrows and you're just like, who are these kids? (laughs) And I went to Wazoo and it's a little closer to who I am. I'm like a little, I don't know. it It was nice to meet other people who are like more connected to like cultural things and other things that are Filipino as well. And then they could kind of teach me a little bit more about like, I don't know, like the food and the things that, because of course I knew like adobo and stuff. Everybody knows that. <laughs> I didn't know like more specific things or even the, what the dances meant or any of that stuff. So it was really nice to start to get plugged into that. And I think it was like the very beginning of me starting to accept my fellow's Pinot side more mm-hmm. and not just feel like I was exotic because that was very much like yeah. how I always felt when I was growing up as everyone's like, because you're every classroom, I was the one different every time. So it was always this weird experience that of why, how you wouldn't come away thinking I'm wrong if everyone around you looks nothing like you and makes a point to tell you you're different. Mm. And it was so nice to be around in groups, full groups of people who look like me. So I was like, it was really great. It's really fascinating because Jeremy's uh, short film is kind of about this, you know, half Filipino, half white kid who um, has this identity crisis where like, right. he has like both sides. And it never really dawned on me because my son, you know, he's half American, right. and I, I guess I never really thought about like what life will be like for him as he grows up, you know, because he's gonna have like both sides to kind of identify with, and and uh, and, and so it really made me think about that, and yeah. um, and it, I never knew that Wazoo was like kind of your intro to. Yeah. Uh, you know the Filipino culture and, and it's different out at Wazoo because we are kind of removed from the west side of Washington State like yeah. th- that was my intro to spoken words I never knew what a spoken word was it was much more it was culturally uh, different in the sense like I felt like there was more art behind um, the Filipino culture in Wazoo versus like I don't know I felt like west side's like you're clinging together so you're like everyone's <laughs> well, just we, like going so there's hard there's a lot of blonde like people at Wazoo nothing That's wrong fun. with that yeah, but you know it's, there's not a lot of diversity uh, when, at least when we were there and yeah, maybe so. it's different now I can't imagine but. yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, well yeah going back to um, like having identity and then for now as a filmmaker and you're getting with the success of this film like what's the reaction been like for your film uh, yeah. I mean, it's been cool. I think there's there's definitely like different types of reactions. It's interesting because it's always like some people. It's like, wow, I've never seen this version of Seattle. It's very interesting. It's so cool. It's like a. Di- it's just like so the people who are not from there. It's like the reaction is always like generally like, well, this is interesting. It's very cool. I never knew Seattle was cool. But blah, these are the type of things I've heard. Uh, and then there's like even my friends from there, and they're like, I wish you could have been more serious though, and got to be more Got the on it but it's like i couldn't do that you know what i'm saying yeah. and then i think uh I don't know, it's it's been mixed as far i'm mixed but i think it's been uh, <laughs> it's been, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's like this weird thing because it's almost like a romantic reception for some people like the sundance people in new york i mean they're obviously a little more like I don't like nostalgic for no no, no like uh like, just like white people from new york and so they're like wow this is really cool and uh 
all that, you know, but I think that's built around like a romantic idea of something they don't know. You know mm. what I mean? And it's not fully like highly critical because they're just fine with it because of that. And they didn't push to have it be better. Like even content was cause they were, yeah. I can't fully like wrap my head around it all the way, but I know like it could, definitely could have been better. But the, there's a, it, through the process, I realized a lot like how hard it is to cast this because of culturally, we just right now don't have the amount of actors to where you, I have hundreds of people that could crush this role to choose from. We, we need to get them on the Filipino American Philam Creative Talent Network group. Right. You know? Yes. <laughs> yes. That's what I was saying. I mean, yes. I could, I, we can you help could you out with that. Yeah. But it's like yeah. the difference. Oh. <laughs> We've got a roster. <laughs> it's just like so much. I just feel like it's so much easier when you're looking for something like this if I were to be looking for a black actor. Yeah. There would be a lot of mm -hmm. people because it's culturally been, you know, you're, you, you only get Michael B. Jordan because so many people are doing it that a yeah. kid who isn't a stereotypical theater kid goes, I can be an actor. Yeah. You know, so. Well, yeah, and that's what, you know, Phil Am Creative is all about is that putting together uh, mostly Filipino Americans, but we do have other Asians and Asian Americans in the organization, but uh, actors, uh, yeah. cinematographers, DPs, sound guys, and yeah, just crew, to, everything. to help people like yourself that have that, that had the dilemma that you had looking yeah. for talented actors. Um, and you know, Carlin James is also, a, he's one of our guys too. He's, he's friends with a lot of folks in Philam Creative. He's come to our meetings and, uh, and you know, we network with each other from there. So yeah, hopefully if you come up with another one and we look forward, do you have any plans? What's your future plans for? Oh, well, I mean, the thing about the short, which is kind of crazy is it was from a long script that I wrote. I kind of just like cherry picked scenes out of it mm. and then like watered them down a little bit. Uh, but there's a much more, I would say aggressive and politically conscious version of this film that I would imagine Seattle wouldn't want me to make very much, but I would love to make, <laughs> you know, Do it. because, you know, they, for me, Minks for Seattle, I would love to make a film that speaks more to the city that I know and speaks more to the type of experience that I understand and has a hero that's an Asian American, Filipino yeah. American guy who could surprise a lot of people. So, you're basically saying there's going to be, hopefully there's going to be a feature link. Uh, I'll try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. It's been a, I, to be honest, it's been a very interesting experience pitching it to people. There's been a lot of like, why don't you just put it in LA? Why don't you make the hero black? A lot of that, to mm -hmm. be honest. So. Well, uh, just, yeah, because I, I'm assuming also like, because, because it's urban or, you know, gritty and it's like, oh, right. kind of correlate it to. Yeah. And they'll be like, oh, character. this isn't, right. I mean, I mean, not, couldn't, you know, there's just been people, film type people around this city yeah who don't believe that this is a character that exists and i'm like i grew up with these kids you know what i mean like yeah yeah I mean, that's not a thing but they're to them it's like who knows what they're actually thinking but mm -hmm. i'm thinking based on some version of a stereotype they're like no this isn't a thing you know what i mean yeah and for one of our earlier guests uh marty go right yeah she was marty talking. was saying the same thing she ha so she's pitching a a feature film that's all Filipino cast. Right. And um, the investors are kind of pushing for, well, you need at least one white guy. And oh, so, I've heard this. Yes. So like, she has one white guy and the rest are all Filipino. And it, it's so fascinating to hear that, you know, with negotiations and how much of a push it is to just change the gender, change the ethnicity, change the whole story because of how somebody looks and nobody wants to push that Asian um, you know, actor forward, which yeah. is why someone's got to do it. Let's and I mean, <laughs> well, that's the, I guess the crazy rich Asian is just like yeah. the, that. That's the awesome thing about the fact that they were able to pull this off. I mean, by itself is mm -hmm. the amazing yeah. thing, right? I'm excited to see it. So, Jaja, how did you get into the whole music video scene and like finding Macklemore, Ryan Lewis, and going into that? Uh, I mean, the Cliff Notes version <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> I started shooting like gangster rap videos for like drug money, basically. Yeah. No, but for real, like the first thing I did was like, five, not the first thing, but the first video I got paid to do was like 500 bucks on Hilltop, Tacoma. Really? Uh, oh. And then just like someone else was like, hey, I'll pay you a little bit of money. And it just kept going. And then I ended up, I was already going to film school because I was like into it. And then just <laughs> the long and short of it is somewhere along the way, Macklemore wanted to do some videos and it sounds easy, but there was a lot of stuff that went in between that. <laughs> I literally just like, 
grinding it out, shooting videos for nothing, you know, and uh, getting better and better at it every time and trying to mimic things I saw that I liked and eventually creating my own style, I guess. And, you know, we made thrift shop. We did uh, like same love. Mago's here. She shot it. Uh, nice. Can't hold us. We shot it. Um, yeah. And that just changed my life and the trajectory of my career. It went from like a super, super long marathon to like a crazy, uh, a shorter marathon, maybe a sprint for a bit, you know, but it, you know, it took you from having no idea what you're going to do and just making stuff for your own to you have all the people that you're supposed to have representing you, you know, you calling you and all these things. So just awesome. from having my own little like Canon 7D shooting a gangster rap video, <laughs> and I just like, I'm in the director's union. It's crazy. It's <laughs> really great. crazy. I have health insurance from directing. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say like, that's really refreshing to hear that you were getting paid for doing gangster rap videos. Not yeah. to knock, but I had friends in college who was doing that, but they're like, some, they'd be happy if they got paid eventually or they get right. the promise and then nothing. <laughs> Yeah, that, I was that's like, I need wild. That. That's yeah. wild. That, that's such a amazing story to like go from all of that. I mean, like I just I remember John John as this quiet kid. He's very sweet. I'm, I'm Still sweetheart. handsome. He looks huh. exactly the same. <laughs> so <I laughs> Hasn't said, aged a bit. I've aged one year in the decade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What vampire yeah. bit you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully, it was Brad Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. Yeah. laughs> Walter, Walter hopes for Ryan. I, I hope Ryan it's Ryan Reynolds. Reynolds. You guys mean? <laughs> oh, I love Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> see, yeah, see? Who doesn't love. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you share with the folks how they can uh, find you, follow you, and stalk you? Um, maybe like on mass transit. Sometimes you can find me. <laughs> no, uh, just Instagram, I guess. It's John John J O N J O N A Y E, and I guess all the other stuff is associated with that. So. There I am. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much for coming and yeah, visiting Voices. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you're here, and hopefully uh, you have a safe trip back to Seattle, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. Hey, guys. I'm Walter Talents, and this is... Arlene Della Pena. And you guys are watching Phil Am Creative's Voices Megapod Part de la Wa. <laughs> <laughs> this week's Phil Am Creative Voices Mega Podcast... We're brought to you by a wonderful and talented and dedicated cast and crew. Director, Rodney Cujudo. Producer, host, Walter Talens. Producer and host, Arlene De La Pena. Producer, director of photography, Winston Fernando. Producer, sound design, Charles Gray. Cam Ops, Ken Chan, Charles Gray, Rodney Cujudo. Sound engineer, Charles Gray, Wally Portacio. Production coordinators, Carla Vega. Roni Canicio, production assistants Laura Bofill, Tony Garbanzo, BTS photography Ren Arietta. Big thanks to all that made this episode possible. 